Salvation. Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, Jesus is the rock, Jesus is the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, blessed be the rock, blessed be the rock of my salvation. Hosanna, Jesus is the
Hallelujah. Father, we thank Hallelujah. you. Hallelujah. Just lift up your hands and begin to worship him wherever you are. The walls are tumbling down. The walls are broken. The walls are down. Every wall of Jericho, every wall of partition against your life, against your destiny, are falling right now. Hallelujah. By the word of God, they will fall. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. Father, we exalt you. We glorify your name. Father, we say have your way. Hallelujah. In Jesus' name. Amen. The Bible says, and by the reason of Titus, he said, and the Lord comfort his people. Anytime the word of God is about to come, it's a time of comfort. And there is hopelessness today because the gospel that is able to build men have not reached to them. But this evening, that gospel that will build you, that gospel that will lift you up, and that gospel that will give you an inheritance among them that is sanctified, is about to come your way. Just prepare your head. I know that God is about to do something new in your life. So wherever you are, I want you to put your hands together as we welcome the man of God, as we welcome Pastor Colin for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Put your hands together for Hallelujah. Jesus, everybody. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Father, we give you praise. We give you thanks again, Lord, because it's because of you we can stand today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glorify God. Praise you, Jesus. It's a privilege to be here again tonight to share in this glorious gospel. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. I want you to open your Bibles with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. We'll start there. And this is the moment of truth. So there are some things we're going to do tonight that I pray and I trust that God by his spirit will give the enlightenment. The word of God says that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. It's very important that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. It's important as we go to the scriptures to understand that not every scripture was given for doctrine. Let's go back to verse 16. Let me say that again. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Not all scripture is for doctrine. Some scripture is for reproof. Some scripture is for correction, and some scripture is for instruction in righteousness, some scripture is in doctrine. And very often, we find ourselves in difficulty because when we try to take a scripture that was intended for correction, and we use that for doctrine, we find ourselves in difficulty. So when the Apostle Paul was talking to the church at Corinth, advising and instructing in certain things to bring discipline into the church, it was for correction. It was not for doctrine. And today we find ourselves divided because what was intended for correction, what was intended for instruction in righteousness, we have taken that and made it a doctrine and it has divided us. And so, as we go through the word tonight, I want you to understand this, because I'm going to give you a word tonight that was intended by God for instruction in righteousness. Hallelujah. I've entitled this message, The Chosen Life. And we look to the book of Ephesians chapter 1, and we read a couple of verses, and then we will go into tonight's teaching. Hallelujah. Bless God. Somebody would say, Pastor, well, what are you trying to say about all scripture? Not all scripture is for doctrine. I can give you examples after examples of things that have been said in the scriptures that was not intended by God for doctrine. But it was intended for instruction. 
If you look to the book of Leviticus, for example, and you see God's dietary laws, it was not intended for doctrine. It was not intended for doctrine. It was instruction. Now, if you follow it, if you follow it, there is a benefit to it. But if you make it a doctrine, it causes division. And so you have people who are angry that you're a fellow believer who eats certain things or who will do certain things that are in the, 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 the divine, the dietary laws of the Lord, but that was not intended by God for doctrine. But let's go to the book of Ephesians chapter 1, and as we go there tonight, we're talking about the chosen life. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints which are at Ephesus, and to the faithful in Christ Jesus, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. According as he had chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Next verse. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of, it, of his will. God has chosen us, in Christ, it was not by random selection, it was the deliberate will of Almighty God. Tonight we're talking about the chosen life. Hallelujah. Every single one of us, we are the sum total of all the choices we've made in life. We are the sum total of all the choices that we've made in our lives. And every choice that we have made is an act of our will. Every choice that we've made is an act of our will. When God declared that I have chosen you before the foundation of the world in Christ, it was an act of his will because the word of God says he does everything according to his own will. So every choice that you make, you make as an act of your will. Some choices were bad choices. Some choices turned out badly and there's a difference. And the difference is, it depends on what you knew before you made the choice. It depends on what you knew before you made the choice. If you make a choice based on all the information that is available to you, and you make a decision and it turns out badly, you have made a decision that turned out badly. But if you make a decision and the information in front of you tells you not to make that decision and you make that decision then you have chosen badly you've made a bad choice and the scripture provides us with countless examples of persons who have made good choices and who have made bad choices and it's important because when you read the Bible and you see of men who would have made bad choices, if you determine that because it's in the Bible, it is for doctrine, then you would say because Solomon had 300 wives of noble birth and 700 concubines, then that is doctrine that is applicable to me. I can do it. Because David went with a man's wife, he then sought to kill that man, and God called David a man after his own heart, you can determine that that is for doctrine, and then that becomes your lifestyle. But not all scripture is for doctrine. The scripture is given to show us what to do and what not to do. So we understand that there are examples of good. There are examples of bad decisions, bad choices that people make. According to 2 Peter, chapter, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 4, hallelujah, the word of God declares that we are partakers, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through us. We are partakers of the divine nature of God, and as Christ is, so are we in this world. So if it is that we have his nature, we understand that God who chose us in himself before the foundation of the earth, foundation of the world, 
by his own will and we have his nature, it means that God has put it inside of us to exercise our will to make a choice. The only person who cannot make a choice of their own will is someone who is overtaken by a devil. But as long as you are not, God has placed in you the capacity because you are partaker of his divine nature to be like him, which is the ability to make a choice. And tonight I'm declaring that your chosen life is the life you choose. The chosen life is the life you choose for yourself or it can be the life that God has chosen for you. But whether it is the life that God has chosen for you or the life you have chosen for yourself, you are living the chosen life now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Turn your Bibles with me to Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15. Hallelujah. So we are partakers of his divine nature. And because we have his nature, we must understand that Jesus, when he walked on the earth, Jesus had the same challenges that we had. The word of God says, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with, our, with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet he remained without sin. If Jesus could not have made a bad choice, if Jesus could not have failed, if Jesus could not have committed sin, then he couldn't have been a perfect sacrifice. Then we couldn't be called upon to follow him or to use him as an example. Because it means that he was above us. It means that he was different to us. But God sent him in the likeness of flesh to be like us so that we can be like him. So the fact that he was robed in flesh meant that he had his own will. Jesus Christ had his own will. The word of God tells us, and we remember well, when he was in the garden of Gethsemane, he said, not my will, but thy will be done. Not my choice, but your choice is what I want. I want your chosen life. That is what I want. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. Hallelujah. Because of the choice that he made, the word of God tells us there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He was a man like you and I, and he was tempted in all points like you and I, yet he remained without sin. And the reason why he was without sin is because of the choices that he made. Today, we live in a time where there is so much spiritism. And every time there is a challenge, every time there is an issue, it is so easy to find a name for it. It's so easy to call it a spirit of this and a spirit of that. It is so easy to find something, some spirit that we can attach the responsibility for our condition. When you scratch the surface and you look deeper, you come to understand that the challenge, the issue, the difficulty may lie very well in a choice that you have made. Those of you who are members of this church, you know I have not made it a secret of my own struggle and my own challenge. When I would have made certain financial decisions, at the outcome of those decisions, when it was hard, it is so easy to blame some spirit or some devil. But it's, I made the bad decision. And the negative consequence of the decision I made, I had to live with. I had to deal with. So I cried out to God for mercy. I cried out to God for help. And God helped me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But God has given us the capacity to choose. God said, let us make man. He made a choice to make man. He said, let's go down and confuse their language. 
He made a choice to confuse their language. God made a choice. Say, let me destroy these people, these wicked people. And God made a choice, as we read in our text, to place us in Christ. We can live our lives by his choices for us, or we can live by our choices for ourselves. One of the scriptures that is very much misunderstood is the book of Psalms chapter 37 and verse 4. We're talking about the chosen life. And I want you to flow with me tonight. Hallelujah. Delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee the desires of thine heart. This scripture has been interpreted by many in this way, in this manner. That if I delight myself in the Lord, then whatever I desire, he will give me. If I delight myself in the Lord, whatever I desire, he will give me. What the scripture is saying is if you delight thyself also in the Lord, and he shall give thee his desires. The desire that will come to your heart will be his desires because you have delighted yourself in him. And if you have that right understanding, you will understand that your prayer will not be profitless, profitless. Your prayer would not be in vain. Your prayer would not be frustrated because if you get his desire and you pray his desire, he is committed to perform that which concerns him. Pastor, what are you saying? Let's look at Mark chapter 11 verse 24. Remember what we said here? That if you delight yourself in the Lord, he will give you the desires of your heart. That desires of thine heart is not whatever you feel for. That desires he's speaking about that he's going to give to you is his desires. And that is why when we come to Mark eleven twenty four, another scripture that we use. Therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire. When you pray. Believe that you receive them and you shall have them. And we have many of us, many believers who are before God because they have a desire. And they say what the scripture says, whatsoever things I desire. So it's whatsoever things I desire. So you desire something that is contrary to the will of God. You desire a woman's husband. <laughs> you desire a man's wife. But the word of God says, whatsoever things you desire. When you pray, believe you shall receive them and you shall have them. But if you understand Psalm 37, 4, and you understand that the desire is his desire, then you understand that God is saying here that therefore I say unto you, whatsoever things you desire that I have given you to desire for, when you pray, believe that you shall receive them and you shall have them. It must be his desire, not your desire. And if you choose... His desire, God commits himself. But if you choose what you want to do, then that is where we find ourselves in struggle in prayer. So it's important that we understand that. And, and the, the point I'm making is in James chapter 4 verse 3, to bring it home, James chapter 4 verse 3, because many of us are frustrated in prayer. We are praying for things and we're praying for things. And we're not seeing anything happen. And it's because you ask and you receive not. Because you ask amiss, that you may consume what you are asking for upon your loss. I remember there was a time I was believing God for some business. And <laughs> this was the test. Every time I talked about and I prayed for this business, and I thought about the money that I was going to get for the business, the honest truth is the first thing that would come to my mind when I get this money from the business was something that was for my family or myself. I'm being truthful. And when I catch myself going through the new house, when I catch myself going through the new cars, when I caught myself going through the new things, then I stopped myself and I said, oh, the kingdom. And it never happened. It never happened. 
And there are many times in our lives where we're believing for things, but the things we're believing for are not the things that he desires for us, are the things we desire for ourselves, as the word of God says, that we may consume it upon our own desires, our own passions, our own lusts. So when we get to that revelation that the desires of my heart must be his desire, then I can ask whatsoever things I desire and it will be done if I believe it will be done. And then I will not ask and receive not because I am not going to ask amiss because I'm asking for what he has placed in my heart to ask for. Is that clear? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So we must pray for the things that God has promised us, not pray for our preference. Let's look at Luke chapter 11, verse 5. Luke 11. And he said unto them, Which of you shall have a friend, and shall go out unto him at midnight, and say unto him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine is in his journey is come to me and I have nothing to set before him. Next verse. And he from within shall answer and say, Trouble me not, the door is now shut, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot rise and give thee. Next verse. I say unto you, this is Jesus speaking, though he will not rise and give him, because he is his friend, yet because of his importunity, he will rise and give him as many as he needed. Next verse. And I say unto you, ask, and it shall be given unto you. We know this scripture well. Seek, and he shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. Next verse. For everyone that asketh, receive it. And he that seeketh, find it. And to him that knocketh, it shall be opened. Next verse. If a son asks for bread, of any of you that is his father, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give for a fish, give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will you offer him a scorpion? This is the verse here. And if then you being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly father Give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him. Everything that Jesus was talking about from verse 5 down to verse 13 was about receiving his Holy Spirit. Ask, knock, seek. The intention, the fervency, the desire that he was talking about, the intensity that he wanted to, for us to have was not for ask, seek, knock for whatever thing you desire. It was not ask, seek, knock for whatever thing you wanted. It was not ask, seek, knock for whatever thing you felt in your heart that would have been good for you. The ask, seek, knock, the foundation of that instruction was that the Heavenly Father will give the Holy Spirit to them that ask. And if our pursuit, if our asking, if our knocking, if our seeking is for the Holy Spirit's manifestation in our lives, it will guide us in the way that we should go are you hearing me tonight so when you read the scripture in the book of Luke chapter 11 and you read that ask and seek and knock I want you to see that scripture within the context of what Jesus said if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children how much more shall your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit when he was speaking what he had in mind was the father giving the Holy Spirit to them that ask of him hallelujah and why did he want to give us the Holy Spirit John chapter 16 and verse 13 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. John 16, 13. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. 13, 13. One, three. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ask, seek, knock. How be it when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that he shall speak. And he will show you the things to come. 
So in the intensity of the pursuit for the Spirit of God, when the Spirit of God comes, He is going to guide you in all truth. So the key to the choices, the key to the choices that we are making is a rest on the source of the information. And if the source of the information is not the Holy Spirit, then we are susceptible to making wrong choices. Beloved, let us not be deceived. God has blessed us with spiritual blessings. God has chosen us in himself. But God requires of us to make the right choices. The right choices. The right choices. Hallelujah. What does the Holy Spirit, when he's come, what does he do for us? The word of God tells us that he reminds us of all that Jesus taught. He will bring back to your memory the things that Jesus would have taught. I'm calling on us tonight to rededicate our hearts, to rededicate our lives for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. For the infilling of the Holy Spirit. For the Holy Spirit to once again take preeminence in all that we are doing. There's some things that we are doing in Christendom that does not have the Spirit of God behind it. Does not have the Spirit of God behind it. Because one of the things of the Spirit of God, he will convict of sin. And we live in a time where... From the time you begin to teach about right living, from the time you begin to teach about the right, from the time you begin to teach about things that we ought not to have mentioned among us, the first thing that you hear is you're preaching law. The next thing that you hear, you're preaching condemnation. So we have moved away from that. We have moved away from that. Because why? No one wants to be accused of preaching law. No one wants to be accused of preaching condemnation but the Holy Spirit the Bible says in John 16 8 when he comes he's going to convict us of sin the Word of God says as we just read he's going to guide us into all truth he says that he's going to glorify Jesus and he's going to testify about Christ that's when the Holy Spirit comes that's what he does that is his work that is his work hallelujah that is his work but not only that is his work the Holy Spirit is speaking about you. The word of God tells us that when he comes in, he is crying out to the Father, saying, Abba, Father. The word of God tells us that he makes intercession for us. He makes intercession for us. So he is not just coming to show us Christ. He is inside of us, working through us to bring us to the place where we live the life that God has chosen for us. Our chosen life. Hallelujah. And he says you are valuable. <laughs> Beloved, tell your neighbor I'm valuable. Tell your neighbor I'm chosen. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Tell your neighbor you're secure. He says you're the apple of my eyes. I'm going to protect you. He says you're a son. This is what the Holy Spirit is saying concerning you right now. The question is, what are you saying about yourself? Because when he is within you, these are the things that you would have witness in your spirit concerning who you are. That you cannot walk with your head down when you know you're the apple of his eye. You cannot feel defeated when you know that he's never going to leave you nor forsake you. There is no way you're going to feel less than who you are when you recognize that you are valuable to God. As I said before, you were not by random. You were not chosen by random. It was the deliberate act of his will. He chose you in Christ before the foundation of the world. It ought to make you feel as you ought to feel that you are indeed a chosen generation. You are indeed a royal priesthood. You are indeed a holy nation, a peculiar people because he has chosen you before the foundation of the earth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And because of how important he is, that is why we are instructed not to grieve him. Not to grieve him. Turn with your Bibles with me to Ephesians chapter 4. We're talking about your chosen life. 
And I've chosen the title, Chosen Life, just to basically bring home the point that the life we live is a life of choices. Hallelujah. Ephesians 4, and we read from verse 25. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Wherefore, put away lying, speaking every man truth with his neighbor. Speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Next verse. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your heart. Don't accuse me of preaching law. I'm preaching the word of God. I'm not preaching law. I'm preaching the word of God. Neither give place to the devil. Next verse. Let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor working with his hands. The thing which is good. Do not abuse the word of God. That you will reap where you have not sown. And you will live in houses you didn't build. And you will reap from feeds you didn't plant. The word of God instructs you. Labor with your hands for this thing is good. And as we were talking, as I've preached in the past, this thing that was going on, it is because we have walked away from the word of God that we want to so get riches. We are not prepared to labor and work with our hands. The thing which is good, that he may have to give to him that need. And when your motivation for everything that you are doing is to help others, God will make it happen for you. But if what you want is to consume upon your own loss, the word of God says, you are asking amiss. Next verse. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to be used for the edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. How many times are we going to use our mouths to speak concerning each other some things that does not edify, that does not lift up, that does not build. And I want you to understand, there are consequences, negative consequences, when we choose to ignore this word. When we choose to ignore this word, there are negative consequences. And the excuses that we give, like Steve Harvey, God isn't, don't, don't be upset with me, God ain't true with me yet. And we, we keep going down that road. God's still working on me. But we do not make a choice to put away. We do not make a choice to change. There are consequences. Let's go next verse. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Next verse. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. It's a choice that we have to make. It's a choice that we have to make. He said, put it away. Let it not be mentioned among you. It's a choice that we have to make. But the challenge we have is that this gospel is too simple. This gospel is too simple. We see those things, we preach those things, and we're accused of preaching law. We're accused of preaching condemnation when we say God says we need to put away these things. And then, when there is an episode or an incident in our lives, we see a demon. <laughs> we can see demon in everything. And we can see demon everywhere. But do you know the reason why you see spirits in everything and demon in everything? Let me tell you why. Turn your Bibles with me to Psalm chapter 91, verse 9 and 10. Why we see demon in everything. Hallelujah. Psalm 91, 9 and 10. Hallelujah. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the most high thy habitation. Look what happens when you make the Lord your habitation. There shall no evil befall you. Neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. As a child of God, if you make the Lord your habitation, 
There is no room. There is no space for you to be looking for this spirit and that spirit and that spirit and that spirit. Because the word of God says when you do that, there shall no evil befall you. Neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling. But if it is that you have not chosen to make him your habitation, then when evil comes, the first thing you do is you call it a spirit of this and a spirit of that. I want to commend to you tonight, in the face of any difficulty and challenge that you are facing in life, before you go searching for that spirit, before you go searching for that demon, examine your choice. Examine your choice. The first place you go, Lord, is there anything that I have done? Is there anything that I have said that would have caused this negative consequence in my life? Search your heart. And if the answer is no, then God would have allowed a circumstance for you to grow. If the answer is yes, you repent and you cry out to God for mercy and for deliverance from that thing. I'm not saying that there is not a space for deliverance. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that there are many times that we are doing deliverance. We are doing deliverance, but we never do deliverance in the way that it ought to be done because we don't cause the person to do some introspection to recognize that the reason why this is happening is because of something I am doing. When you get to the root and you understand that it is what I am doing that is drawing and attracting this evil that I'm asking to be delivered from, and you just make a choice to change, then that thing that was being attracted would be repelled because you choose to walk in obedience. Amen? Amen? We have no difficulty believing. And I'm not preaching down to you, as I always say, the laborer is the first partaker. <laughs> we have no problem believing. Apostle will come and apostle will preach week after week. It's not a question of whether we believe. We are here because we believe. You're tuning in here now because you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You're tuning in to us right now because you believe that God is. The issue is not whether we believe. Even the devils believe and tremble. So it's not about what we believe. The challenge is, what have we done with that divine nature given to us to exercise our will to choose? What have we chosen for our lives? What have we chosen for our lives? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It's submitting our will to God. That is our challenge hallelujah hallelujah i've said it before and i'll continue to say it we cannot live in disobedience and call the negative consequences that we experience an attack of the enemy we cannot continue to live in disobedience and call the negative consequences of disobedience an attack of the enemy we must recognize we must recognize that there are things that we need to make a purpose decision to change. A purpose decision to change because God is calling us to make that change. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 15. Book of Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 15. See, I have set before thee this day life and good and death and evil. Next verse. And in that I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God, to walk in his ways, to keep his commandments and his statutes and his judgment that you may must live and multiply. And the Lord thy God shall bless thee in the land whither thou goest to possess it. Proverbs chapter 26 verse 2. As the bird by wandering, as the swallow by flying, 
So the curse that is causeless shall not come. The curse that is out cause shall not come. What am I saying? Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. For curse is every man that hanged on the tree. We understand that. We understand that no man can keep the law. And any man who is seeking for salvation through the law is guilty of the curse of the law, which was death. So there is no salvation in the law. But it's not that the law was bad. The law was given by God to show us how sinful we truly are. I wrote something down here. Hallelujah. The only how man could have known what was sin was through the law. Because man by his nature was doing what was natural to him. That sinful nature was natural to him. And every command that God gave to man was to deal with something man was already doing. Paul said, I was alive without the law once. And when the law came, sin revived in me. What you're saying is that before I knew that this was wrong, before I knew that this was sin, I felt alive. I felt good. I felt okay. But when the law came, the law showed me that this what I was doing, I ought not to be doing, that activated that sin, that knowledge of sin in my life. So sin, sin was imputed onto us because of the law. So it's not that the law in itself didn't have its purpose. But when we talk about living our choice life, it's important that we understand that God has given us instruction for living. And we must follow his instruction to avoid the negative consequences of disobedience. As we are in a place of grace, teaching of grace, teaching of law. Let me show you a scripture. Romans chapter 6 verse 14. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. For sin shall not have dominion over you. For you are not under the law, but under grace. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you are under grace. It means, therefore, that if sin is having dominion over you, you are under the law. Because the only how sin shall not have dominion over you is if you are under grace. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law. But you are under grace. So the expectation of the apostle is that you are not supposed to be living your life with sin having dominion over you. Anytime sin is having dominion over you, it means that you are under the law. <laughs> Anytime sin is having dominion over you, you are under the law. But Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. So that you will no longer be under the law, but you will be under a grace. Why do I say that? Turn to the next verse. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. So the understanding is that not because you are under grace means sin can have dominion over you. Once sin has dominion over you, you are not under grace, you're under law. Because if you are under grace, sin cannot have dominion over you. Because as I preached two weeks ago, grace is not just the, it, the unmerited favor of God as we like to define it. Grace is an empowerment from God to serve. It's an empowerment from God to serve. And when you are under grace... There is no way you can be under grace and see sin and don't feel and don't sense and be uncomfortable. It can't happen. It can't happen. 
It can't happen. But this, this happens when you're under law. Thou shalt not commit adultery when you're under law. But I didn't go. I didn't touch. I only watch. And you feel good because you didn't go. I didn't kill anybody. I never take up a knife. I didn't stab anybody. I didn't kill anybody. And you feel good. You're under law. But when you're under grace, you understand that if you only look, Father God, help. You understand that when you call your brother a fool, you understand when you hate your brother that you have already committed murder in your heart. You say, Father God. So when you're under grace, there is no way sin can have dominion over you. Because under grace, the Spirit of God convicts you of sin. There was no conviction on the law. <laughs> Let me leave that alone and let's go. So as I was saying before, because we don't understand, many people fall and run after the shadows, they run after the figures. So time and time again we talk about it's not in the anointing oil. Time and time again, we talk about it's not in the handkerchief. Apostle will talk about it all the time. But it doesn't matter how much we talk about it. It doesn't matter how much we say. We still have confidence in it. We still have confidence in it. Not understanding that by choosing to put your confidence in the oil, in the figure. By choosing to put your confidence in the shawl. By choosing to put your confidence in the handkerchief. You have made a choice. You have made a choice to remove the spirit of Christ from his operation in your life by putting confidence in that which was supposed to represent him in the time before he indwelled man. So if you are finding yourself where you must have that handkerchief, you must have that shawl, you must have that oil, you must have that oil, and you are not recognizing that those things were speaking in times past of him who was to come, then, because you have placed your confidence in it, the way you choose to live your life will be impacted by that decision. Are you hearing me tonight? So with the negative consequences that may come upon our lives because of our choices, we need to understand something. And I want to take a little time here. Hallelujah. God will allow calamity to come in your life for one purpose to correct you and to draw you back to himself whenever you find yourself in disobedience and you have a negative consequence don't be too quick to blame devil don't be too quick to blame devil because you see if God allows us in disobedience to prosper we will never change if God allows us in disobedience to prosper, we never change. But the word of God says, who you love, he chase on. So when we look at Joel chapter 2 verse 25, and he talk about, I'm going to restore unto you the years that the canker worm, the palmer worm, and the locust would have eaten. He called them my great army. And I will restore unto you the years that the locust they had eaten, the canker worm, and the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. My great army, which I sent among you. Not the devil. But as you read the scriptures, you begin to understand because of a choice that they would have made. There was a negative consequence. And God allowed this to happen to them. To bring them to a place of repentance. And now God was going to restore them. So there are times when you may find yourself with calamity around you. Be a negative consequence. God allows that negative consequence to draw you back to, your, to himself, to bring you to the place where you will decide to forsake your way to walk in his way. Because if it was not for that calamity, if it was not for that negative consequence, you would not have made the decision to change your course. 2 Samuel 24 verse 12.
Hallelujah. Go and say unto David, Thus said the Lord, I offer thee three things. Choose thee one of them, that I may do it unto thee. By background, David had transgressed, David had done evil. And God was about to visit the nation. Next verse. So God, who was a prophet, came to David and told him, and said to him, Shall seven years of famine come unto the land? Or will thou flee three months before thine enemies, while they pursue thee? Or that there be three days pestilence in the land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. David contemplate. He had three choices. This is David's choice. And David said unto God, I am in a great strife. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let me not fall in the hand of men. Next verse. So the Lord sent a pestilence. Who sent it? Who sent it? Who sent it? The Lord sent a pestilence upon Israel. From the morning even to the time appointed. And there died of the people of Dan. Even to, from, from Dan even to Bathsheba. 70,000 men. Next verse. And when the angel stretched out his hand upon Jerusalem to destroy it. The Lord repented him of the evil and said to the angel that destroyed the people, It is enough. Now stay thy hand. What am I saying to you? <laughs> the God you serve has not ceded his power, his authority, his dominion to the devil. No devil can do whatever he wants to do on the earth. Anything that is taking place on the earth is taking place with the sanction of God. Pastor, what do you mean? Today I set before you life and death. Choose life. Death is available. <laughs> there is one who comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. God said, I set before you life and death. Choose life. But death is also available. When the choice for death is made and death has his full work, we will blame the devil. But what I am saying to you is that God set before you life and death. And he is encouraging you to choose life. To choose life. Joshua at one point in time said, you can choose whom you want to serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve the true and living. It was a choice that you had to make. Don't go choosing what God says not to choose. And when the negative consequence comes, blame the devil. My recommendation tonight is the first place you look at is your choice. Look at your choice. Because whether we like it or not, where I am today, the life I live today is my chosen life. Where you are today, it is your chosen life. And by God, if we want to see the glory of God, if we want to see the glory of God upon our lives, if we want to live different, if we want to see difference, we've got to make different choices. When I was growing up, they used to say, only a mad person does the same thing over and over and expect a different result. Only a mad person does the same thing over and over and expect a different result. God is calling on us to make different choices. Is that okay with you tonight? Is that okay with you tonight? Amen. So we must do a couple things to get to the place where we make the right choices. The word of God encourages us to pray. But as I said earlier on, when you pray, don't pray amiss. Pray with understanding. The first thing is you must delight yourself in the Lord so that the desire that is in your heart, the desire that is in your heart will come from him. So you don't pray amiss. The second thing you must do, you must wait for an answer. Too often we're praying and we're not waiting 
to hear God say to us, this is the way, walk in it. We are not waiting for the Holy Spirit to guide us in the way that we should go. We need to obey the word of God. We need to obey the word of God. We need to avoid doubt. And we need to watch our associations. The word of God instructs us, don't let the ox and the ass plow together. Many, many people, many believers are struggling in business, in life, because of the associations that are around them. You can't be ox and in yoke with an ass. You won't go very far. You won't go very far. So if you're making a decision and if you're making choices, but you are yoking yourself with people who are not of like mind, like spirit, you are going to find yourself frustrated in life, frustrated in prayer, frustrated in God. There is need for a choice to be made as to whom you would yoke yourself with. God wants us to accept the leading and prompting of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will lead, he will prompt, he will guide. We just need to be sensitive to what he's saying. You need to seek godly counsel. A believer of the Lord Jesus Christ is not a power seeker. A believer in the Lord Jesus Christ is seeking the word of God. He desires the sincere milk of the word of God. He desires the word of God. Not power. Because not everything that is spiritual is divine. Moses threw down his rod, it became a serpent. Serp Pharaoh's magician threw down their rod, it became serpents too. So if you're moved by rod being turned into serpent, you're going to be deceived. So you are not moved by signs. You are not moved by manifestation. You are moved by the word of God. And never you say because your man of God is not manifesting mirror signs, as you would like to call it, that he doesn't have the word. He doesn't have no power. We like that. This man powerful. This man powerful. This man powerful. This preacher powerful. This one is not so powerful. But is he sound in the word of God? Is he sound on the word of God? That is what you need. Because it's the word that will make you grow. Exercise your faith. Exercise your faith. And ensure that his desire is your desire. His desire is your desire. Tonight I want to commend this to you. Wherever you are, wherever I am today, is as a result of the choices we have made in life. God has chosen us in himself before the foundations of the earth. And he did so because he had a plan and a purpose for us. It was deliberate. It was according to his own will. And he has expressed to us in his word what it is he desires for us to do. What he desires for us to become. Whether or not we become what God says he wants us to become, it depends on the choices that we make. Because whether you choose to live the life God wants for you, or you choose to live your own life, right now, at this very moment, you are living, I am living, my chosen life. And tonight, if the chosen life you are living does not line up with the word of God, there is an occasion and an opportunity for you tonight to come before God and say, Father God, here I am. Help me. This is not the season and the time to hold on to behaviors and hold on to habits and to hold on to mindsets that have been weighing us down for years. Deliverance after deliverance, prayer after prayer, and we have never addressed the choice that we have made. Seeking spiritual help, seeking spiritual help, 
Seeking the power of God, seeking to be prayed for, going one place or the other place. It's the water, it's the rag, it's the oil, it's different things. And you never stop to recognize the problem lies in my choice. If tonight you're listening to me and you want the power of God to work in your life so that you can make different choices... Tonight, let us pray. Ask, seek, knock. All of those things. But what he was talking about was getting, receiving his Holy Spirit. That is the key. Because when the Spirit comes, he would guide you into all truth. He will convict you of sin. He would testify of Jesus. He would teach you the things that Jesus taught. And when you're in that place where he's allowed to have his full way in your life, you can say like Jesus, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Heavenly Father, God, tonight we choose life. Father, we choose to obey your word. We choose to always examine our hearts through the mirror of your word. Lord, to be more like you. Lord, where we have disobeyed you, where we have chosen our own, Forgive us. Be merciful unto us. Lord, tonight we ask that you will reverse any negative consequence in our lives today by reason of the choices that we have made. Father, this life that we live in the flesh, we determine tonight to live it by the faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. This is our chosen life, Lord. This is the life we choose. This is the life we choose. We ask you to help us. We ask you to empower us that we could live our chosen life, the one you have chosen for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. If you're listening to me tonight and you have been making decisions concerning your life and there are negative consequences, that you are seeing. You have never accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. I want to declare to you tonight your destination your destination lies within you exercising your choice. If you choose tonight to accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior the Holy Spirit of God will indwell you. And he is empowered to guide you into all truth and to bring you into the perfect stature of Christ. If you're here tonight, I want you to pray with me. Heavenly Father, I come to you tonight. I ask you, O Lord, to forgive me of all my sin. Wash me and cleanse me in your precious blood. Make me your child. Be my Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I trust that this word would have ministered to you. As I said, all scripture is given by God. For doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness. May we all make that conscious decision to choose the life that God has chosen for us. Amen, amen. We want to encourage you to join our apostle tonight at 11.30 for prayer. And also encourage you to be again here with us on next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. For another time in the word of God and for a time of praise and thanksgiving. We thank you for joining us this evening. May God richly bless you. May God protect you. May God keep you until we meet again. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good night. God bless you.